Oh, hey. So, you guys have actually stuck around this far, huh? Are all the lazy people gone? Okay. Okay, good. Well, awesome. Well, today, we're going to talk about putting it all together. And when I say that, I mean being able to construct the systems that will help you solve interview problems much faster than parsing a problem piece by piece. You've studied your patterns, and you know how to solve problems, given enough time, hopefully. If you aren't, then stop here and go back and study some more. Because at this point, you should be very, very familiar with all your patterns. There really isn't a formula that you can apply to every problem that you'll encounter that will magically spit out the right answer for you. That's not how software engineering works. Rather, engineering is a collection of heuristics that somehow people have collected based on years of experience. And for the most part, they seem to be pretty effective at actually giving us the right answer, or at least guiding us to the right answer. And that's what you should be developing with your studies as well. You can think of it as codifying all the vague tips and tricks people have been telling you to do, but you never really understood when or how to use them. Today, I'm going to give you two of my templates that I use to actually try to get the right answer quickly. While these work for me, they may not necessarily work for you. After all, heuristics are rules of thumb and require a sense of how they work and where they come from. There really isn't a concrete proof behind why they work, but instead, these are based on my personal observation and what I believe works best. So, welcome to the coding interview. You suck. Now, the first heuristic I use is how I approach any problem. You might have picked this up by now, but essentially, I try to match the problem to a known pattern. If that doesn't match, then I will generate examples to build a pattern from. Finally, once I have my naive solution, I'll iterate over it again and try to optimize the substeps. So here's the approach. 1. Look at the characteristics I see in the problem. Can I combine a sufficient number of these characteristics and match them to a known data structure or algorithm? The second step. If I cannot match it to a pattern, I'm going to go generate a few examples. What are the patterns generated from the examples? What will the algorithm approximately look like? Once I've done that, then I can generate the naive solution and move on to step 3. For every step in the algorithm, go back to step 1 with the question, how can I optimize this substep? Now, you can go from steps 1 to 2 to 3, but you're never allowed to go from 3 to 2 or 2 to 1. If you do, this means that your pattern matching is bad and you have not had enough practice. Now, this gives us the best of both worlds. It allows us to use study to front load all the hard work so we can quickly and easily get to a base skeleton from which to work off of. We can then focus our attention on actually filling out the details instead of trying to throw random solutions at the problem. This allows us to improve the quality of our solution. So what problem in our problem solving does this actually address? Imagine all the times you had to spam the leak code submission machine or patch your own code in order to find that you've broken the base case. Now imagine doing that, except no matter how far away you stray from your original design, you will never be able to break the accuracy of your base case. Sounds like a miracle, right? It's almost like there's some kind of architecture where it's really easy to write things a certain way and very difficult to blow yourself up with. And this is where patterns come in. They essentially act like that architecture and structure for your thinking. You've already proven that it works in your studying. All you really need to do is focus on the details and fleshing out the idea. The core logic is already there, and it should be bulletproof because you've proven it time and time again. The rest of it should just be fairly simple and straightforward. For instance, for recursion, the only details that you really need to fill in are the base case and what parameters you want to pass in. That being said, you should be able to break down the problem into the key characteristics and then pattern match it as I have mentioned in previous videos. This will help you match the solution to a pattern more quickly. The key for me is knowing when to give up on a pattern or know when I'm using a pattern incorrectly. As you saw in my last video, I was able to come up with a rule to identify when I have incorrectly used depth for search versus breadth for search. And this is where I start applying those rules and differentiations. The sooner you can give up on finding a pattern or the sooner you realize that you are going down a dead end, the less time you will waste. That being said, the second step of this, generating examples, is actually very time consuming, but it's also very accurate 
as it forces you to actually understand what is being asked. For me, I usually try to generate meaningful examples that cover all possible cases as a proof that my solution works. What I see most people do instead is just generate random examples, but a lot of these times, these examples at their core are no different from each other. For instance, an array of 13203 is usually not any more meaningful than 30182 because both these are fairly random and spread out. Usually, these examples should test a very specific property. For instance, 12345 will attest ascending order, 54321 will attest descending order. If you cannot extrapolate a pattern simply from the examples, then chances are you have not had enough practice doing so. These patterns are usually relatively simple, like ascending or descending order, or skipping certain elements. Being able to generate meaningful examples is fairly critical in this step to making your solution bulletproof. For me, finding that I've covered every possible case, like a mathematical proof, is the best way to make sure your code is rock solid. That means that I have something to always go back to, and I can just focus on making sure I write the correct code. Finally, once I've generated the initial naive solution, I'll go back to every sub-step and try to improve it. Am I iterating over the same set twice? Can I use a faster algorithm at this particular step? Maybe I can use a hash map instead of recursion. All these are questions that I've identified and are aware of that help guide my thinking, but that I also don't have written down because these questions come from a sort of game sense. That game sense is what you develop when you practice problems. As hand-wavy as that sounds, it's also a actual thing. Being able to quickly approximate in your mind where you can face potential issues and understanding how to avoid them to begin with. But hopefully you get the point. You should know at this step what questions you need to ask to make your solution faster and more efficient. This is where my second system comes in. The second system I use is for determining how to improve the runtime of my algorithm. Whenever I look at a problem and I think I can make the runtime faster, I will follow this chart. Order 2 to the n to 3 to the n is usually reserved for np hard problems or permutation. Order n squared or n cubed types is reserved for recursion, generating subsets, or nested for loops. Below that, you have your order n log n, which is your sorting or heaps. Order n or linear time is your iterations, pointers, sliding windows, and common array operations. Order log n is binary searches and exponentially smaller size searching. Finally, you get to constant time or order one, which is reserved for hash maps or looking up indexes in an array. Now, how do you use this chart? The way you use this chart is that you wanna go from orders of larger complexity to smaller complexity. This means that the operations you can and should use are limited to the ones below the time complexity that you want to achieve. For instance, if you are going from order n squared to n log n, then you are limited to binary searches and heaps. You cannot use nested for loops in order to achieve a faster time complexity. Of course, n log n itself might not necessarily be the most efficient time complexity. You could potentially have a linear time complexity as your optimal solution. In that case, then your only option is to be able to iterate in a linear time over an array or an array-like structure, like lists. If you end up with a non-optimal algorithm that you cannot improve on, your ability to recognize patterns is also fairly bad and needs work. The reason why this usually occurs is because you've identified the wrong characteristics to focus in on. You can wind up with non-optimal algorithms from the start if you recognize the wrong characteristics. For you AI and machine learning geeks, this is the locally optimal solution. So make sure you know and can recognize optimal solutions and patterns beforehand. For instance, if you do a recursive implementation of dynamic programming, you are unable to recognize the characteristics of a dynamic programming problem, so you should go back and practice that again, and again, and again, and again, so you never make this mistake again. There are probably a ton of heuristics out there that can be used, like caching a previous result, combining operations, and so on. But realistically speaking, if that is the only thing preventing you from passing these interviews, then it's just really doing a matter of random leak code problems and finding and developing those heuristics. You're probably already doing pretty well. But as we mentioned before, you should always take every single step you can in order to eliminate luck as a factor. So that'll do for me. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.